A double replacement reaction is a little bit different than, uh, than a single replacement reaction, but it's got the same kind of idea, and I like to use dance analogies for double replacement reactions as well. In a double replacement reaction, what happens is that there are two cations and two anions, and so we have to assume then that we're working with ionic compounds, and what happens is the cations and anions switch partners to make two new compounds, potentially. Now you'll notice here I've got pictures of two compounds, Fred Flintstone uh, with Betty Rubble, as she would eventually be named once she married old Barney. And then secondly, you may not recognize this guy. Maybe some of you who are old cartoon aficionados will recognize George Jetson. Somehow he has traveled back in time and is hanging out with uh, Wilma, who of course doesn't belong with George Jetson. She's meant to be with Fred. Well, if we put these two compounds, if you will, into a reaction together, we might end up with two new, two new compounds. And so what we've got is a switch uh, partners, more or less, you can imagine this happening, say, on a reality TV show or perhaps more casually at a, at a dance or something. And so they arrive at the dance and the, and the couple's on the left, and after a while they switch and end up in the partners uh, that you see on the right. And what do you know, one of them works out okay, and lasts forever. Notice as we do one of these compounds that the cations and anions have to stay cations and anions and have to partner up in that way. So Fred switches with George Jetson and is now with, at the end, Wilma while George is with Betty. Now cations and anions then have to go together. You can't put two cations together because they have to be opposite in charges in order to attract to each other and make a compound to work. Otherwise they would repel. And so cations and anions tend to go in the, uh, the partners that you'd see here. What happens in a double replacement reaction that makes it actually visible to us is that you end up with two products and one of them will be soluble. In other words, it can dissolve in water and the other one will be insoluble and can't dissolve. We call that one a precipitate, and you see that word here. Precipitate meaning a, an insoluble compound that forms and then becomes visible. We see it usually as a color change, but what you're seeing as a color change is almost always the idea of, of a microcrystalline sized pieces of a new compound. In lab you did this and you saw a white cloudiness appear in part D of the lab because one of the two new compounds that you were putting out, uh, putting together, was forming a precipitate. The formula that we have here, kind of like the, uh, the Flintstones clip art a moment ago, WX plus YZ yield WZ plus YX. And notice I've got the colors here, green and red, very intentionally repartnered on the right, green and red, green and red. And so it looks as though W switched with, with Y and now has Z as its partner on the right, while Y has X. And so the green ones would be the cations, and they should go first in the compounds. The red ones would be the anions and should go second. In lab 19, these were the two reactants that we put together, barium nitrate, you see I got them as green and red, and sodium sulfate, green and red again. Now if they switch partners, sometimes using just the names, it's a lot easier for us to figure out what the names will be. We can say that barium would go with sulfate, and sodium would go with nitrate. So there's barium sulfate and sodium nitrate. Now notice again the colors, green and red, have stayed the same, cations and anions. And one of those two compounds, barium sulfate or sodium nitrate, would now be your precipitate. So in the lab when you had a white compound form, one of those two is your precipitate that has formed, is crystalline solid, and shows up as a visible solid that's, that's there as microcrystals. Again, sometimes it looks milky white rather than like a chunk of, of a solid salt or a crystal or anything. But it's the crystals that are super small, and because they're so micro-sized, there's billions of them in your little test tube, and you see it as more like a paint almost, when it's actually small suspended crystals. If you gave that to enough time, over time the crystals would settle to the bottom, and you'd have a thin layer at the bottom like snow uh, coating the bottom of your test tube, which kind of looks like precipitation. And the words kind of connect then. So snow settles to the ground and layers things in white. So would that compound that you made in the test tube settle to the bottom of your tube and have a thin layer of white sort of sediment or, or compound solid at the bottom of your tube. In our reaction from earlier, Fred and Wilma, eventually on the right, you can see connected. And they look so loving. Oh, uh, Fred and Wilma, if you follow the Flintstones, of course, lived happily ever after. And... Uh, the show sort of branches out of their life. On the other hand, we've got uh, George Jetson and Betty Rebel, which is an odd couple. It would never work out, and you can see that they're facing away from each other and do not connect, and so they would be soluble. When we represent this in a compound, then, soluble meaning, again, that it dissolves in water, 
and the precipitate here, the one that's labeled as a red precipitate, is a, is a compound that connects together and they don't separate again. And so they have joined together and of course Fred and Wilma were married and had kids and whatever, so off we go from there. They're a compound that worked, the other one didn't. And so if you think about this happening like at a dance, perhaps two couples arrive at prom, uh, they're going just as friends, and during the course of the prom a new couple gets together and dances and dances again and dances again and, and falls in love and whatever, lives happily ever after. Um, this is, of course, back from the good old days when people actually danced at prom and didn't just get into a big pit and run into each other. Keep in mind, as we're running, in, as we're running into these equations throughout the rest of this, this uh, unit, you'll see a lot of times uh, crystalline and aqueous as the state symbols for these. A soluble compound is one that has dissolved into water. Remember, we use the symbols AQ for that. A precipitate would be a crystalline solid. And you'll remember the symbol that we used for an ionic crystalline solid is a CR. So back in your notes, when you have solid liquid gas and then aqueous solution and crystalline solid, those symbols are going to start to show up in these reactions as we work on them going forward. The final reaction type is a combustion reaction. A combustion is the fun one, it's burning fuels and basically the idea of a combustion reaction is when a fuel, hydrocarbon, uh, burns in the presence of oxygen. All combustion needs oxygen to happen and you can read about it in, in a, any number of articles or books. You can also hear about it in Mythbusters that you need the, the three key ingredients for combustion to occur, a fuel, oxygen, and some ignition source to get the thing going. That's true, absolutely. Every combustion reaction will produce water vapor. This is why you can see the exhaust on even a well-tuned car in the dead of winter because there's, there's steam, there's water vapor coming out the back of their exhaust pipe and it's condensing as a little cloud behind the car. It's also why you see water dripping off of many exhaust pipes. The second product that you can see from a combustion reaction will be one of two things, either carbon dioxide, if the reaction is complete combustion, and we see here then a general equation for complete combustion. On the very first place there you see a hydrocarbon fuel. Notice the formula is a little weird, CXHY. And that just means that some number of carbons and some number of hydrogens at the very least are needed for it to be a fuel. X and Y can be lots and lots of different things. And a lot of fuels can contain more than just carbon and hydrogen. They might contain oxygen, they might contain sulfurs, phosphorus, nitrogen, something else that's burning as well. But the simplest of all fuels will contain just those two elements, basically. The ones that we'll work with in class and the, the uh, gas that's coming out of your Bunsen burners, for example, is one of the simplest of all hydrocarbons. And so as that, that one burns in this reaction with oxygen, it's producing water in the form of a vapor gas and carbon dioxide. If the reaction is incomplete combustion, you won't get carbon dioxide, you'll get carbon monoxide. Other than that, the equation's exactly the same. Notice how these two equations are practically identical. The only difference being at the very end, where you see CO2 or CO. Carbon monoxide is produced in the case of incomplete combustion. And so complete makes carbon dioxide, incomplete makes carbon monoxide. Of course, that's a lot more dangerous because carbon monoxide, if it builds up in, in a closed space, can uh, knock you out, make you unconscious, and even kill you. Which is why, hopefully, if you have natural gas burning anywhere in your house, you have a carbon monoxide detector. Uh, so that if anything goes wrong with your heating system or whatever, you'll have uh, a detection that will tell you when to get out of your house before you die. Uh, this happens tragically to people all the time across the country, especially in, in older houses or perhaps uh, poorly uh, ventilated houses uh, or in, in places where you have uh, your, your furnace or your water heater burning surrounded by lots of other stuff, junk boxes, something stacked in there next to it uh, where it can't get fresh air and it, it produces carbon monoxide or it backs up because your chimney is plugged or who knows what and uh, you get all kinds of tragedies from something like that. So how do you know which one you're going to have, complete versus incomplete combustion? It's based simply on whether or not there's enough oxygen around. Combustion prefers to be complete, and so it will be complete whenever there's enough oxygen around, basically. If there's enough oxygen, you can make CO2. If there's a shortage of oxygen, you can only make CO1, you could, you could say. Making carbon dioxide takes two oxygens, making carbon monoxide takes only one. So if you start to run out, you'll switch, combustion will switch, from complete to incomplete. And it when, it's when oxygen begins to run out that this happens. Even your car, which can produce carbon monoxide, won't produce much, if any, if it's tuned right and you're getting fresh air in there and the air is getting into your engine uh, through a clean air filter and a well-tuned car, then you won't make much carbon monoxide because even your car can burn as complete combustion more often. 
Good news is it also makes more power that way. You get more energy and more miles out of every gallon of gas if you burn that gasoline completely rather than incompletely. So not only will you, will you get more money, uh, more miles for your money, you'll be making less uh, dangerous carbon monoxide gas as well. In lab part E, in combustion, we actually made the fuel gas first. So the calcium carbide and the water were bubbling and making the fuel that we burned. We're not going to worry about the reaction for calcium carbide with water because that's not combustion. That's actually different reactions altogether. But when we burned that, and some of you were quite surprised with a little that you got when you put the uh, the flame to your bowl of foamy bubbles and they burned rather cool. Um, when, when that happens, you're burning what's called acetylene gas. And acetylene is, is a, an important gas in, in things like welding. You were making it with calcium carbide and water. And when you burned it, here you can see it as C2H2. That's acetylene, uh, the gas used in this reaction, burning with oxygen to produce water and well, was there oxygen in abundance or was it running short? Well, hopefully you weren't feeling dizzy, lightheaded, short of short of uh, breath or anything in that lab because you were in a big room in a big school and wide open and there wasn't a shortage of, of oxygen in the room. Otherwise, you probably would have been dizzy or passing out. And so we can assume that there was an abundance of oxygen in the room that day and you were, you were burning your oxygen and your, your acetylene through complete combustion, uh, not incomplete. And so we'll call it complete combustion and end our reaction with CO2. So that's your example equation for lab 19 and you've got now example equations for each of the reaction types as we go. What I'd like you to do is go back to your reaction uh, sheet you've been working on. Initially I've assigned you the first side of it 1 through 13 uh, to write those word equations into chemical equations and see if you can identify each of those first 13 as one of the five main types of chemical reactions. Single, replacement, double replacement, synthesis, decomposition, or combustion. Um, if I've assigned you the back of the page by now, you should go on and uh, classify those ones as well. So whichever equations you've worked on that page, go back and classify those and uh, see if you can figure out which reaction type they'll be, which one they fall under. That's it for now. Thanks.